So, we welcome you to this new video presentation by Jawaharlal Nehru Planetarium. In this video presentation, uh, it leads us to the understanding of uh, light. There are two chapters of light in uh, the NCERT textbook that is prescribed by the Karnataka State Education Board. And uh, we have reorganized these two chapters uh, in a particular fashion, which helps you to appreciate uh, the nature of light as well as uh, the various phenomena that we come across in our daily life that are related to light. So many of these uh, uh, light related phenomena uh, such as uh, reflection, refraction, scattering of light and uh, image formation by mirrors and lenses and of course the defects uh, of the human eye. All these are uh, discussed um, over three or four parts of this video presentation. And in this first presentation, we have an introduction to the nature of light. So when you ask the question what light is, what light is made up of and why light behaves the way it behaves, these are very profound questions that you are asking. So these are the questions that bothered best of minds of the philosophers and scientists over um, several centuries. It is only in the last 300 to 400 years that we have begun to understand in a very scientific manner as to what the nature of light is. So in this first presentation, we would like to take you through uh, some of the ways in which scientists have thought about the nature of light. How did they actually come to this particular idea that uh, light behaves in a, a particular fashion or what light exactly is? So we will take you through these uh, questions uh, as far as possible in a chronological order. And this is a very interesting question and that's the reason why we would like to discuss uh, in the very first presentation about the nature of light. Having said that, we should also admit that uh, discussing these profound questions and communicating that to a student of high school is a very, very difficult task. We will try our best to express these things in a simplified manner and we should know that whenever we try to simplify uh, our description of anything, we will be losing out on details. Hopefully, we will be able to uh, put together all the core ideas at least and convey the excitement of uh, uh, how scientists have answered this question as to what light is. For most part of our wakeful life, we live with light. Even now we are surrounded by light. So light is very, very familiar to us. But familiarity, however, does not guarantee that uh, it is easy for us to understand light. It is just like the human nature. We are always uh, surrounded by humans all around us. But does that make it any easy for us to understand the human nature? Now you might have spent 10 years, 15 years, 20 years with your best friend. Um, but yet, it may be extremely difficult for you to describe the reaction of, uh, or even to guess the reaction of your friend in a particular situation. Fortunately for us, light is not all that complex compared to studying human nature. And people have been able to understand uh, the nature of light a lot more precisely than understanding the nature of human beings. Now you take for example uh, in this box. So we have uh, a material, we have a material inside, a lens like this which is mounted inside. Now even before I show you the actual path of light um, the, or the change in the path of light caused by the presence of this lens, I can predict what the path is going to be. So let me demonstrate this with an experiment here. Now we are using, we are using small particles of uh, unbur unburned particles which are given out by uh, some form of an incense stick, samrani antivala, ado. 
So it gives a lot of smoke. And the smoke helps you to observe the path in which light travels. Okay, so this is the path in which light travels. If there is no smoke, if I were to show it here, you hardly see how light actually travels from one point to another point. So here, we have placed a lens uh, in the path. Now without the lens, first I would like to show you how light actually travels in this box. You find that light travels in a straight line. So light travels in a straight line there, okay? So now, well, as it is traveling straight, I put this particular lens in the path of light. And even before I shine light through lens, I will tell you that light is going to bend downwards as you can see here. So that is my prediction. And so there you see that light goes in a straight line from the light source to the lens. And after passing through the lens, it is another straight line. But the two straight lines are not in the same uh, direction. So there is a bending of light towards the bottom as I had uh, precisely predicted with this lens. So it is one thing to uh, predict and then see through an experiment that that is exactly what happens. But the next harder question is to explain why light behaves in a particular fashion as it passes through that particular lens. Therefore, it is possible to understand the behavior of light once uh, we carry out experiments like this. But then to explain why light behaves in this particular fashion, we have to know what the nature of light is. Light is. So great thinkers have thought about this, uh, about the nature of light. And they came up with different ideas about light as to why, uh, which would probably explain why uh, light behaves the way that we saw here. So when you have different ideas about light given by different people, how do you find out which of these ideas is correct? So one way is to test, um, uh, one way is to see if these ideas are useful in explaining certain phenomena brought about by light. So one is uh, uh, what you saw right now. Uh, when it passes through one kind of a lens, why does the light beam bend downwards? Uh, so such phenomena we should be able to explain. Secondly, there are other natural phenomena that we see around. For example, the formation of shadows. So here I have a, a source of light. And when I bring an opaque object in the path of light, you'll find that there is a shadow cast on the screen, on the board here. Now, any idea about uh, light that I try to explain should be able to explain why shadows are formed and why shadows have a close resemblance to the shape of the object uh, which is blocking light. Such questions must be answered. Therefore, the first requirement of uh, any idea that tries to explain what light is, what the nature of light is, is that it should be able to explain uh, certain f natural phenomena like the formation of shadows. Then uh, one of the grandest uh, uh, natural phenomena which is related to shadows is the eclipses. So we should be able to extend our idea about light to explain uh, how these ph phenomena come about. Then there are beautiful rainbows that we see in uh, nature. In fact, November and December uh, is a very nice time to see many of the optical phenomena outside in the sky. And rainbow is uh, not very uncommon uh, during some of these times. How do rainbows occur? So rainbows, while they are very, very beautiful to uh, see, it also props up a question, how these rainbows are formed? And why the rainbows have to be formed in a particular fashion? Um, the, orders, the order in which the colors are arranged in a rainbow is very, very um, repetitive. Every single time you see a rainbow, you see the order of the colors in exactly the same way. Sometimes you see two rainbows, uh, as you see in this picture. There are two rainbows, a primary rainbow and a secondary rain, uh, rainbow. And the secondary rainbow, you'll find that the order in which the colors are arranged are exactly in the reverse of what 
the order that you find in the primary rainbow. Now, what is the cause of this reversal? Now, any explanation about what light is should also be able to explain to us how these rainbows are formed and why so many different uh, uh, rainbows. In addition to rainbows, we also see uh, colorful rings of light surrounding the sun and the moon occasionally. And why these uh, uh, rings, come, uh, rings of light come about is uh, uh, a very interesting question once again. Again, the answer to this question will be related to uh, what light is and why, and why light behaves in a particular fashion to give this ring of light around the sun or the moon or why rainbows are formed, why shadows are formed and in turn how we understand eclipses. For all these phenomena, observing the phenomena is relatively easy. You just have to look up in the right direction at the right time and you see rainbows, you see eclipses, you see shadows and uh, 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 you see rings of light around sun and moon which are known as halos. This is invisible. So nature of light is invisible but the phenomena brought about by, by light is, are visible. So from what are visible, we try to make a guess about what is invisible to us. So this is the reason why different scientists would have uh, different ideas about uh, what light is based on what light has done under certain conditions. Other than the phenomena, in recent times we have also uh, invented uh, a number of optical devices. Uh, to begin with, we had um, the pinhole camera, the one of the oldest ones uh, in terms of optical devices. And uh, I'm sure many of you would have done this as a project in your fifth standard or sixth standard when pinhole cameras were first introduced. They are very easy to make. But in order to explain how a pinhole camera functions, you need to know the nature of light. Without understanding the nature of light, it is impossible to explain why pinhole camera works the way it works. Then telescopes came to be invented and microscopes came to be invented. So both telescope and microscope um, happened in a very short span of time of one another's invention, both in the 17th uh, century. And uh, both of them changed uh, the way we understand uh, nature. So telescope helped us to progress our knowledge in uh, astronomy. Microscopes helped us progress our knowledge in biology. So we saw two different kinds of worlds which human eye can never ever see. Now in order to understand how these devices can be made better and better so that you see um, phenomena in all its rich variety, it is important that you understand the nature of light. Without understanding the nature of light, it is impossible to design these devices which will uh, function to a level of uh, precision that you want. In fact, one such uh, uh, work by Sir Isaac Newton, he was actually trying to improve the design of a telescope. The, the telescopes in those days used uh, lenses. And now, Newton observed that these lens-based telescopes, when they formed an image, the edge of the image had a colorful uh, uh, presentation. So while the colors would actually um, make the object, the image look uh, beautiful, these colors are not part of the object originally. Or in other words, you will come to wrong conclusions about the object that you are studying with the help of these colored images. So Newton wanted to uh, overcome this particular problem that the telescopes had. And uh, it is because of this particular problem that he began a scientific investigation into light. He had to understand, I mean, he realized that he had to understand the nature of light before he could design telescopes which did not have these uh, uh, problems that lens-based telescopes uh, had in his time. So what he did, how he did, and uh, finally what was the result of this investigation is something that we will be discussing in a later presentation. But this is, for the time being, this is to highlight that um, observing phenomena helps you to 
ask questions about the nature of light. So whatever the nature of light, if it can explain the phenomena, if it can explain the optical devices, uh, how they function, in addition to these, if the, if the nature of light that you have come up with, if it can explain some phenomena, um, not explain exactly, if it can predict the presence of a particular phenomena under certain conditions, and suppose this phenomena has not been observed by you at all, and later because of the prediction you find that the phenomena actually exists, then your confidence level in that particular uh, idea about the nature of light goes up. Remember, this nature of light is something that you cannot see. So you make a guess. So to check if your guess is right, you try to predict some unobserved phenomenon and when that is uh, observed, then the confidence level in the guess that you have made about the nature of light is, will actually go up. Now, if you have to understand light, if you have to uh, explore the uh, phenomena related to light, first of all, you need to have uh, a source of light, right? So you need to have a source of light. So what are the different kinds of uh, sources of light that uh, uh, we have? So we have uh, one of the most common sources of light, which is uh, a burning candle. So in the most uh, primitive stages, this was uh, the source that dispelled darkness after sunset. So it is producing light. Now I can also produce light by taking a filament bulb like this and then passing current through this. We observe that this also produces light. So a candle by burning produces light and uh, The bulb, when you pass current through that, it, it produces light. And uh, I also have here something, a smaller version, a smaller version of the street lamps that you see, the sodium vapor lamp. So when you, when you pass current through this, This also lights up, this also lights up as you can see. So we have already three sources of light, the uh, burning candle, then a sodium vapor lamp, then uh, we have uh, a filament bulb. And these days, these days we also use uh, a very interesting uh, source of light, which you see here. And uh, I shall switch on the light now. Okay. So here, these uh, red, orange and green light that you see here, these are uh, actually the LED bulbs, LED lamps. So we have uh, so many different ways in which we produce light. So this is the first requirement. Now we cannot end this uh, series of examples about uh, production of light by uh, different ways without uh, a reference to the sun. The sun produces uh, light and it produces enormous amount of light as we all know. And the sun actually produces uh, light uh, by a very complex mechanism. But the fundamental idea is that the nuclei of hydrogen, they combine to form a nucleus of helium. So when this happens, enormous amount of energy is released. So what keeps the sun shining is because of this particular process which is known as nuclear fusion. So fusion is to combine and it's the combination of uh, nuclei, therefore it's called nuclear fusion. So through all these examples it is clear that if we have to produce light, this is the most important point that I would like to make. If we have to produce light, you need matter of some kind. You need matter of some kind. So it could be uh, paraffin wax in the candle, it could be some kind of a semiconductor that goes into the making of LED or it could be the tungsten filament that goes into the formation, that goes into the making of this filament of the bulb 
or it could be uh, some uh, sodium vapor that you fill inside a, uh, a bulb. So you need materials of different kinds in order to produce light. So remember this, to produce light you need matter. One of the things that you should also notice uh, in uh, these examples uh, which underlines that uh, matter is essential for light, just matter alone will not bring about light. There has to be some form of change in some aspect of matter and it is this change which is exactly that is responsible for the production of light. So you can hold this uh, uh, candle for any length of time, it will not burn. The, but the moment you uh, light up the, uh, the wick of the candle, again it's a beautiful science as to how this candle actually burns. But to cut the long story short, I'll just tell you that the paraffin wax with which this candle is made that melts at the uh, bottom of the wick here, the uh, top portion and it rises into the wick, it becomes vaporized and the vapors actually react, uh, they mix with oxygen and there is a combustion reaction because the temperature that is supplied by, by this match stick, the temperature that is provided by this match stick is sufficient for this combustion reaction to take place. Therefore, what you find is that, what you find is that for this light to be produced by paraffin wax candle, there has to be a combustion reaction. So there is a chemical change that is taking place which is resulting in the formation of production of light. Similarly, if you take uh, the sodium vapor lamp that you find uh, on the streets, when you pass current through sodium atoms which are present in that uh, small bulb, okay, so there is a small bulb here in which sodium vapor has been taken and when current passes through that sodium atom gets ionized, it loses electrons and it gets ionized. So it is this ionization which is responsible for the production of light. Therefore, there is a change in the atomic state of uh, sodium to ionic, its ionic state which is responsible for production of light. Therefore, no matter what the uh, source of light is, how much light is being produced or what form of light is being produced, there has to be a change in some aspect of matter. Even the sun is not an exception to this. So there, it produces energy only if uh, a nuclei of hydrogen combine to form a nucleus of helium. So there is a transformation of one element into another element completely which, is, which results in the production of light. So two important points we have seen here. To produce light we need matter and to produce light we need some changes in matter. Now once you have a control over a source of light and you can produce light uh, according to your uh, uh, requirement. You can switch on or switch off, you can put on a candle or a put off a candle. When you have this kind of a control, then you can do experiments to study the various kinds of uh, light related phenomena. It could be shadow formation, it could be pinhole uh, camera image formation and so on. Once you study the, uh, once you study these uh, phenomena, in great detail that will help you to make uh, some intelligent guesses about what the nature of light is. So ultimately we do all these things to understand the nature of light. So I would like to conclude this part of the presentation uh, by, taking exam uh, by taking a few examples from the living world as well. So we produce light uh, according to our uh, uh, requirement by a number of processes. There are chemical changes, there are physical changes, there are nuclear changes on the sun. So all these produce uh, light. But in the living world, there is a wide variety by which uh, uh, light is produced, especially by the organisms which live deep in the ocean. Therefore, the living organisms at such uh, depths have one option evolve mechanism to not to use light in their daily life. So for their motion, for the preying, for, uh, for predating, for escaping from predation, for all these things they have to do without the use of light. 
So this kind of an evolution becomes uh, inevitable. But the other solution to this problem is you, they produce their own light. So that way also they can survive. So what we find is that in the living world, in the deeper parts of the oceans, you find examples of both kinds. So there are animals, organisms which have no visual organ at all. There is no visual sense organ at all. And there are also or, uh, or organs in certain uh, living systems which produce their own light. So this phenomenon is called bioluminescence, uh, light which is uh, produced by living systems. There are some beautiful examples of um, certain kinds of jellyfish, then there are certain kinds of uh, squids, and then there are um, single celled organisms which uh, sometimes come to the surface of water in the ocean as you see in this particular video and you just disturb uh, the uh, surface of water and you, you find that beautiful bluish uh, glow uh, which is because of uh, these uh, single celled organisms uh, which thrive there. Suppose you were to ask the question, suppose you were to ask the question what light is, there could be different ways in which you can answer this uh, question. One of the earliest answers that you got from your school days from your middle school days is that light is a form of energy, okay. So light is a form of energy. So what do we mean by uh, light, uh, uh, that light is energy? So what we mean is that uh, since energy can be transformed from one form to another form, when you say that light is energy, we should be able to convert this light into other forms of energy. So this is something that uh, uh, we can show very easily with a couple of experiments. So here I have uh, uh, something known as a solar panel. So this is a solar panel and there is an internal circuit in which uh, we have a, a, a voltmeter that is connected to the uh, solar panel. So you know that a voltmeter actually measures a potential difference. So whenever there is a, an electric current flow in a, an electric circuit, the voltmeter will show a deflection. So right now, there is no current flowing through this, therefore there is hardly any deflection or no deflection at all. So now, I shall uh, uh, perform a simple experiment in which I will shine light from this, I will shine light from this filament bulb onto, onto the solar panel. So there is no deflection in uh, the voltmeter as you can see here when there is no light falling on the solar panel. Now I bring this light, bright light source and you will find that uh, voltmeter deflects, okay. So what we have done is we have used the light energy from the bulb to produce electric current in the circuit. So we have been able to transform light energy into uh, electrical energy. So this is the meaning of saying that something is uh, energy or something is a form of energy. We should be able to convert from one form to another form. Now in the language of physics, when you say that something uh, is energy or something has energy or something possesses energy, uh, there is one more implication that we look for. So with energy, we should be able to do work. So in the language of physics, work means bringing about a displacement on account of application of some force. So work done is force into displacement. So work done is equal to force into displacement. Now does light cause any kind of displacement in any, um, uh, um, in matter that we know around? It looks very unlikely. Can light push things? There is a beautiful example which I would like to take from, uh, from the field of astronomy to show you that uh, light can indeed uh, apply some kind of a pressure on uh, matter and then move matter. So you see on this, in this particular picture, um, a gray mass of uh, some irregular shaped uh, object. This is actually a comet. Now you may not believe that uh, this is a comet. This is how a comet appears when it is far away in our solar system. 
uh, when I say far, it is farther than uh, uh, say where planet Jupiter is. At such distances, this is how a comet uh, would be, just an irregular shaped uh, uh, frozen mass actually. It is mostly composed of frozen carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, methane uh, and such gases. Now as it uh, moves into the solar system towards the sun because of the sun's gravitational pull, then what happens is that gradually it grows a tail. Now the picture of a comet to us is always that of some object which has a tail. Now how does this tail actually come about? There is no tail uh, uh, that a comet has when it is uh, very far away uh, in the solar system. Now it grows a tail as it comes closer and closer to the sun, then what happens is first of all sun's uh, heat melts the frozen matter that is there uh, that forms the chunk of uh, uh, comet. This is called the nucleus of the comet and then this frozen matter once it is uh, uh, melted and vaporized, uh, the radiation from the sun actually pushes the vaporized material away from the sun and it is this which gives the uh, tail, the appearance of a tail to a comet. Now the, the, appearance, the, the formation of this tail by a comet is actually because of the pressure which is exerted by the radiation from the sun. And what does this radiation contain? It contains one part light that we can all see and another part light that we cannot see. So there are light of different kinds. But generally when we talk about light, uh, we mean light that we can, uh, human beings can see. But there is in principle something like light uh, beyond, uh, beyond our senses. And all this forms the solar radiation and that radiation uh, applies a pressure on these particles which have vaporized uh, in the comet and uh, it is that pressure which is responsible for blowing and moving the uh, particles away. I mean this is a core explanation, uh, let us not get into actual uh, uh, details. So this is a, a beautiful example to show that light can move matter. And in, again in recent times people have done some fantastic experiments of uh, uh, in controlled conditions how laser beam can be used to transport matter in the laboratory conditions. But talking about a laser, a laser is a very intense source of light. I mean we saw various uh, sources of light earlier. Laser is a very, very intense source of light and uh, it may surprise you that you can use a laser beam actually to cut a thick block of steel. Okay, usually you are familiar with uh, uh, some kind of a gas welding equipment which produces so much of heat that uh, uh, steel block is cut. But nowadays you can make very, very high precision cut um, in whatever shape you want using these laser beams. So what you are doing there is you are using the light energy that is in the laser beam to convert into heat and that heat is so concentrated and so hot that it will melt steel and cut it. So this is another example to show that light is a form of energy. We have changed light energy to heat energy. So, so far, so we have seen two extremely important uh, ideas about light. One is that um, um, behavior of light can be uh, predicted if we know the nature of light. So, so far I have not discussed the nature of light, but I just showed you that it is possible to uh, predict and then we showed the predictions uh, coming true through some experiments. And the second part is that uh, to produce light you need uh, some changes in matter. So changes in matter produce light. Now similarly, light also produces uh, certain changes in matter and because of that light energy can be converted into other forms of energy namely electricity, heat and um, certain other forms. Now all we have is uh, a set of these phenomena around us, a set of uh, examples around us. 
to see what light does. So light heats up, light produces current, then light can move things, then light um, uh, changes its direction in certain cases and so on. So from these observable things that we have, we have to go to the point which cannot be observed, namely the nature of light. So what is the nature of light is the next question. Now generally, uh, this is the method that we use in doing science. So we know something, we observe something and we try to match the two. We try to explain what is observed through what we know. So in this case, um, we try to understand uh, the phenomena produced by light and through that we try to understand uh, what light is. This is a very long, there is a very long history to this particular uh, answer to this particular question. Uh, but we will cut short once again um, for a number of reasons and hope that you will be inspired to uh, read up uh, the details of this particular historical development of the idea related to nature of light. But I will just take uh, two or three examples very quickly to impress upon you how people thought about the nature of light. Now one of the first um, uh, scientific uh, ideas about the nature of light was given by Newton. Like I told you earlier, Newton wanted to understand uh, uh, why certain colors which are not there originally in the object are seen uh, in the image produced by a telescope. So for, uh, for in order to overcome this particular problem of the telescope, he had to know the um, answer to this question about what light is. So he thought that light is actually composed of particles, small, small particles, so small that you cannot see at all. And he called these particles as, uh, he called these particles corpuscles, okay? So he called these uh, corpuscles. Now corpuscles, you are familiar in biology, red blood corpuscles and uh, white blood corpuscles. Corpuscle simply means a tiny bit of matter. So to Newton, light was actually a tiny bit of uh, something which he called corpuscle, whether matter or not, we will not worry right now, uh, but he called them corpuscles. Now corpuscle is just a name, just like uh, this is called a ball. Ball is a name given to this object. That doesn't mean much to us. But if I were to tell you that this ball can be uh, actually deformed by applying some force and a large amount of force is required to deform this particular ball, it tells me something about uh, the hardness, it tells me something about the elasticity of this uh, uh, material with which this ball is made and so on. So when I describe this ball in terms of its elasticity, in terms of its hardness, uh, in terms of its bouncing ability and so on, then I have more knowledge about the ball. So just the ball itself does not mean much. Similarly, when we say that uh, light is made up of corpuscles, it does not mean much. Newton knew this. So what Newton did was to assign some properties to this corpuscle, just like we assigned properties to this ball through its behavior. So Newton f said that uh, these corpuscles, um, as they move, as they move, they have kinetic energy. You know, kinetic energy is familiar to you. Uh, any particle of mass m, any object of mass m moving at a velocity v will have a kinetic energy of half mv squared, right? Similarly, Newton assigned the same kinetic energy to the corpuscles of light and he said that a moving particle of light, the moving corpuscles of light have a, a kinetic energy of half mv squared. And secondly, uh, any particle that is moving will also have a momentum, okay? Momentum is a product of mass and uh, velocity. So momentum is represented by small p. It is equal to mass of the object into the velocity with which it moves. Therefore, corpuscles were assigned two characteristics, one momentum and the other is energy. Now, why did Newton assign these properties to corpuscles. Like I told you earlier, 
whenever we try to make a, a guess about something that we don't know, the guess that we make will make use of the knowledge about something we already know. Now Newton, he was already successful in formulating the Newton's laws of motion, the three laws of motion that you know. And uh, through that he had defined what force is, what momentum is. Therefore, uh, this branch of physics called mechanics, it deals with the objects um, which move according to Newton's laws of motion. They can be described using Newton's laws of motion. So Newton knew this and he was successful in doing that. So he said, let the particles that I call corpuscles for light, corpuscles of light also have the same properties that I have given to the bodies in mechanics. Or in other words, Newton was trying to use the knowledge of mechanics to understand optics, to understand light. And through this, he was able to explain why light moves in a straight line. Now rectilinear propagation of light is known to you. So Newton said, it's very natural from his first law of motion, any object which is not uh, subjected to any kind of force will always move in a straight line which we call the inertia of motion. Therefore, the corpuscles also moved in a straight line and therefore light moves in a straight line. And once you know that light moves in a straight line, um, uh, that light moving in a straight line is a correct way to think about propagation of light, then he used that very nicely to understand uh, uh, the formation of shadows and uh, eclipses and so on. But even before Newton had come up with this idea of uh, this idea of corpuscles moving in a straight line and that is because of uh, Newton's first law of motion, people had explained uh, eclipses on the basis of uh, um, on the basis of a um, on the basis of rectilinear propagation of light. So if you look at the diagrams of eclipses, you will find uh, rays of light coming from the sun uh, in a straight line. So they had guessed that light moves in a straight line. Now Newton was able to explain why they move in a straight line because they say, he said that corpuscles of light follow the same principle as the objects that he finds in mechanics. And also a particle is always associated with momentum and energy. So light also had some uh, energy and momentum associated with that. Therefore, looking at light as a corpuscle with energy and momentum was a fair description of the nature of light as far as Newton was concerned. And Newton was pretty successful in explaining a lot of uh, optical phenomena using this. But then nature has a way of surprising us all the time. Just when you think that you have a uh, you have conquered nature, nature's laws, nature's behavior, then nature is, so to say, it bowls a googly at you uh, in a way that you can't express, you can't expect, and uh, it challenges your mind once again. So just when we thought that we had explained uh, the behavior of light with many of the phenomena that are familiar, there were a few phenomena which could not be explained on the basis of uh, this corpuscles of light, okay? And uh, one such is, uh, uh, one such is uh, the soap film and the soap bubble. If you look at a soap film, like you see here, you'll find that over a period of time, the soap film, if it is stable, it displays beautiful colors and these colors keep changing with time. So is the case with soap bubbles. Now why should soap bubbles produce colors? Then why are these uh, uh, colors coming about? Now Newton was unable to explain the formation of these colors on the basis of his particle nature, the corpuscle nature. So some of his contemporaries, especially Thomas Young and Christian Huygens, they belonged to another uh, group of people who felt that light was not actually corpuscles, but light was actually a wave. Interestingly, a wave is also a carrier of energy. A wave is also a carrier of momentum. So if you say that um, in order to explain uh, behavior of light, uh, I need to think of something which has momentum, something that has energy, 
then it turns out that there are two candidates who, who are uh, likely for this. There are two candidates. One is a particle as Newton thought, and another is a wave like uh, Christian Huygens and Thomas Young thought. Now, both of them were able to explain uh, the optical phenomena that they observed. So, rectilinear propagation was observed, uh, was explained, uh, reflection of light was explained, and even the colors on the soap films, which Newton could not explain. Now, in the wave picture of light, one could actually explain that also. So, what do we conclude from all this? We conclude that while wave explains everything that is explained by particle, wave also explains certain things which are not explained by particles. So, wave nature of light seems to be superior to particle nature of uh, light. But remember, you can neither see a particle of light nor can you see a wave of light. So, a wave the wave nature of light, if you think that uh, light behaves like a wave, uh, you can explain all the phenomena of light. If you think that uh, light behaves as a particle, then you can explain some of the phenomena of light. So, since uh, wave forms a bigger set, uh, wave explains a bigger set of phenomena, it is likely that uh, most, some people opted for wave nature. But still it does not settle the debate whether uh, nature of light is that of a particle or nature of light is that of a wave. Now, you have to do some again experiments. You may recall that in the beginning of this presentation, I told you that any new idea that you come up with, uh, uh, which will help you to explain uh, the nature of light, to describe the nature of light, it, one thing is to explain the various phenomena. The other thing is, if you could actually um, predict a phenomenon which has not been observed before, then that kind of uh, an idea would be uh, even better. So, now the time has come for me to show you that particular phenomenon which people uh, actually predicted and that prediction had not been, uh, that predicted phenomena had not been observed earlier and uh, when uh, the experiment was actually done, they found that this phenomena is indeed exactly as predicted. Therefore, the initial guess that you made about the nature of light must be true. So, what is this phenomenon? This phenomenon is uh, uh, the phenomenon of diffraction. This is called the phenomenon of diffraction. So, when you, you know that light travels in a straight line. Well, it travels in a straight line when it has a lot of space. If you allow light to pass through a very small region of space, if you constrain it to move only through a small portion of uh, an opening, then you find that light actually spreads out, okay. So, we, uh, we have, um, we have this laser pointer, when I shine light, it actually forms uh, a single spot on the uh, board there, okay. So, now this single spot on the board can be explained on the basis of particle nature of light as well as on, uh, the, on the wave nature of light. Now comes a very interesting thing. If I were to, if I were to, now what I am going to do is to shine light through a small opening between two uh, blades which have been stuck there. So, without passing through the small opening, this is the spot that you see and through the opening, you will find that uh, light spreads out, okay. And in a more spectacular way, I can show you, there is this, uh, uh, there is a small attachment to this laser pointer and what this attachment contains is a small piece of plastic on which small lines, parallel lines have been drawn and these lines are so close to one another that in about, um, uh, about one inch, there would be about 25,000 lines that have been drawn. You know, one inch is about 2.5 centimeter. So, you can find out the gap between two successive lines. So, when you do that, this is how light spreads out. This is how light spreads out. Now, this spreading of light is what we call diffraction. Now, this does not happen 
If light is not confined to pass through a small opening, then you just get a, a single spot there. But when you allow it to pass through small openings, then you find that light spreads out. Now, this spreading of light uh, uh, is what we call diffraction. So, there were some very important unobserved predictions that were made about this diffraction. And this diffraction itself was explained on the basis of uh, wave nature of light con by considering light as a wave. Because you can't have corpuscles which are going through a small opening and splitting into a number of corpuscles in different directions. That's very hard to even imagine. But whereas with a wave, it is possible to explain that way. In a, in a future uh, uh, video presentation, I'll be going into the physics of this particular thing, uh, phenomenon. So wave nature of light uh, uh, triumphed because it predicted a phenomenon which had not been observed before. Whereas the particle nature of light, at best it could explain some of the phenomenon, not all of them, and it did not uh, predict any unobserved phenomenon. Now, when everybody thought that, uh, well, the debate about the nature of light had been settled once and for all, and that there is a, a wave nature is the ultimate one, like I told you, whenever you think you are very comfortable and you have explained everything that is there to be explained in science uh, about some behavior in nature, nature has a way to spring a surprise. So nature sprang a surprise once again uh, when, uh, when the scientist by name Henrik Hertz, he observed an effect called photoelectric effect. So what is that photoelectric effect? Um, if you take the surfaces of certain metals like sodium and then you shine light on the sodium uh, metal and if the light has a certain minimum energy and above that minimum energy, it will always produce an electric current. Okay, so that is the photoelectric effect. So photo, light, electric. So pr production of electric current using light. Of course, nowadays it's a common place. Um, there are different variations of this photoelectric effect, one of which I showed you with a solar panel, and there are many others. Now, how do you explain this photoelectric effect? Now, photoelectric effect takes place from a particular metal only when the light energy is uh, uh, beyond a certain uh, amount of energy. Below that, below that energy, no matter how intense the light is, you will not get uh, uh, electricity out of this phenomenon, uh, through this phenomenon. But once you have a minimum uh, energy and beyond that inten intensity will only make the current more or current less, but photoelectric current will always be there. Now to understand this, once again, wave nature was not, uh, was not good enough. Why is this? So again, once again, I will cut this long story short and I'm taking away all the physics, charming physics that is there behind uh, this explanation. But I'll just mention that the actual explanation of this photoelectric effect was given by uh, Albert Einstein and for this he was given a Nobel Prize. Now, what did Albert Einstein do? Uh, Albert Einstein brought back the particle nature of light and he could explain the photoelectric effect considering that light is made up of particles. Now you may say, why should Albert Einstein be given Nobel Prize? Didn't uh, um, our Isaac Newton do it long before? Well, particle is only a word here which is common between Newton's picture of light and Einstein's picture of light. But like I told you, uh, a ball doesn't mean anything unless we spe specify the properties. So the, in terms of properties, the particles of Newton and particles of uh, Einstein are two different kinds of worlds which have no meeting point at all. So in Einstein's uh, nature of particles, he said that these particles have energy, but they can't take any energy that is available. They can take only certain packets of energy. So it is like on the number line, you have 0, 1, 2, 3. So you can have light particle of uh, uh, energy 1 unit, energy 2 units, energy 3 units. You cannot have particles of light of energy of 0.1 units, 0.2 units, 0.3 units. 
So it comes only in units of one, two, three, four, integral multiples as an example, okay? So with this picture, uh, he was able to uh, explain and in the process, he brought in a beautiful idea called quantum. So this packets of energy is called a quantum of energy. So light particles can have energy equal to one quantum, two quanta, three quanta, four quanta. Fractional quanta not allowed at all. In fact, Einstein himself gives his example and I shall close this particular video session with this. It is like uh, uh, purchasing milk. Suppose you have 10 liters of milk in the barrel. Now you can now draw milk of any volume from this 10 liter barrel, however so ever small. So uh, if the same barrel is now filled with uh, uh, milk taken in sachet, if there are 10 packets of uh, one liter each, so the, the shopkeeper will either give you one liter or two liters or three liters. So in between, uh, fractional uh, volume of uh, milk is uh, unavailable. But that doesn't mean that milk cannot exist uh, uh, in, in a continuous form. The moment you cut open the sachet and you take the milk in the barrel, you again uh, can uh, draw milk of any volume you want. So what does all this mean? What this means is this, that um, like I told you, the main question that we want to answer, we wanted to answer in this session was about the nature of light. And this nature of light can be particle nature as Einstein ge has given or as wave nature which Thomas Young, ha Christian Huygens and later on uh, many more people, in, uh, notable among them um, Augustine Fresnel, all these people have worked on wave nature of light. So if you ask whether light is a particle or light is a wave, now we, the answer is that uh, it could be both depending on what phenomena you are trying to explain. If you want to explain why photoelectric effect happens and why it happens in a particular fashion, then particle nature as given by Einstein is the nature of light that you should be using. But if you ask uh, uh, why soap bubbles produce colors, why light spreads when it has to pass through a very narrow opening and such phenomenon, then wave nature of light is what you will be using. So uh, the nature of light could be particle plus wave nature or it could be something else which maybe one of you will come up with uh, in your lifetime which will combine the properties of the particles of Einstein with uh, the particles of, uh, with the waves of uh, Huygens and Young and Fresnel and maybe you'll come up with some other entity. Uh, so we never know. But we can only say as of now, all the phenomena of light that we have, we come across, we can either explain in terms of particle nature of uh, light or through wave nature of light. Uh, ultimately, uh, like I told you, this nature of light is invisible to us. The phenomena brought about light is visible to us. So we try to um, guess the nature of light by studying the phenomena. The day we come across another phenomena which cannot be explained by either of these uh, two natures that we know, then we know that we are uh, having an incomplete idea about nature of light and we think about uh, another uh, nature of light which can explain the new phenomenon which has not been explained by the other two. So I think I will stop here and uh, if you have questions, feedback, uh, uh, please do write to us uh, on the email ID that you find here. Um, and we hope that uh, even though this particular part of this presentation is not part of the syllabus that, cover, that is covered in class 10, this orientation of uh, uh, thinking is very, very essential to appreciate all the properties of light that are discussed in the two chapters of light in class 10. So in our next uh, video presentation, we will through a number of experiments demonstrate uh, the, these properties of light and discuss and again and again we will come back to particle nature and wave nature and see how they explain these uh, phenomena um, in a very um, 
satisfactory manner. So until then, uh, see you next time.